When large construction projects are built, governments can use something called eminent domain. This essentially forces people to move out of their homes to make way for the new construction project. But the people in today's video refused to move out and stood their ground, and they're the focus of today's video. So join me as we take a look at 15 people who refuse to move out of their homes. Number 15. The Nanning Nail House China is known for its breakneck urbanization, and as a result, a Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has a few qualms about knocking over people's houses so that roads, department stores, and condominiums can be built right through them. However, property laws prevent the CCP from physically forcing people out, and sometimes people will simply refuse to sell to the government. Known as nail houses, due to the fact that they stubbornly stick out like a nail in an otherwise completely changed area, they're a thorn in the side of government planners, and by far one of the most famous is the Nanning Nail House. This house was part of a village that was relocated in the 1990s, yet despite the fact that it's in terrible shape, the owners refused to sell. As a result, a road was built around it, and even today, the house is still standing. Number 14. The Highway Circle most people would be against living right beside a highway, but the owners of this apartment complex had no choice. You see, the government hoped to build a road through their property in the South Chinese city of Guangzhou. But when the owners of the apartment block refused, the architects just chose to build around them. Now those in the apartment are encircled by a multi-lane highway, and to this day, many joke that those living there have a room with a 360-degree road view. And while I'm sure that 24-7 noise from the highway is far from enjoyable, at the very least, these residents are located in a spot that's very convenient for their morning commutes. Number 13. St. Joseph's Catholic Church Most Catholics would consider their churches to be sacred places of worship, so just tearing one down wouldn't exactly get you on the good side of most parishioners. However, in 1944, Joski's department store tried to do just that in San Antonio, Texas. They were looking to tear down St. Joseph's Catholic Church, which had been a Gothic Revival landmark in the community since 1871, in order to build a massive superstore. Unsurprisingly, when the teardown was put to a vote, the parishioners unanimously disagreed, and this caused Joski's to simply build their new store around the chapel. To this day, the church has been surrounded on three sides by the walls of the store, and it's been given the nickname St. Joski's as a result. I would say that the decision to keep this beautiful church standing, no matter the cost, was a good one. Number 12. The Shuzhou Nail House In China's eastern city of Shuzhou, real estate development has been on the rise, and its population has exploded in recent years. While this has led to widespread real estate speculation and the building of plenty of luxury housing units, the Shuzhou Nail House seems to be stuck in the past. You see, while the entire neighborhood surrounding the proposed building site agreed to sell, the owners of this house refused, and it now stands as an old two-story home with a large yard and a sea of cookie-cutter luxury villas. And while property value of the nail house may be lower, I'd say that it has far more character than any of the buildings constructed around it. Number 11. The Thirsty Beaver Nothing is quite like an old dive bar by the side of the road, and while many have been demolished or abandoned in recent years, the Thirsty Beaver is a notable holdout. Located in the American city of Charlotte, it was opened by brothers Mark and Brian Wilson in 2008, and ever since its opening has stood out as the quirky spot in the neighborhood due to its strange name, the constant playing of country music, and the red-eyed beaver painted on the side. Yet when it was announced that a high-rise was to be built in the area in 2017, the Wilsons refused to budge, even though countless other restaurants and bars on the street agreed to be bought out. As such, the developers were forced to build around them, and to this day it's still possible to grab a drink and listen to some funky tunes at the Thirsty Beaver. Number 10. The Nail Tomb While most nail house owners are alive and well, this story concerned the resting places of relatives who were already six feet under. You see, in 2012, a development company made the decision to build a multi-story residential complex on the side of a former cemetery in the Chinese city of Taiwan. While the vast majority of the affected families allowed this to happen, one family in particular refused to sell, even after being given a $160,000 offer. They questioned why, of all places, a cemetery was an appropriate place to destroy. Yet despite their protests, the construction company carried on, and this led to a 10-meter tall mud pillar housing the tombs being maintained while the building's foundations were built around it. 
Eventually, the family had no choice but to cave in to the pressure and reportedly had to take an extremely massive pay cut. They reportedly only received $128 and the privilege of removing their deceased loved ones from the plot of land as compensation. Number 9. Michael Forbes Donald Trump is certainly controversial, and it should come as no surprise that he appears on this list twice. You see, in 2007, Trump was in the process of building a new golf course in Scotland and hoped to get his hands on the farmland owned by Michael Forbes. He offered Forbes the 2022 equivalent of $750,000 along with a job at the course that would pay him about 80 grand a year. Forbes refused and instead spray-painted two massive messages on his farm saying, no golf course and no more Trump lies. This royally pissed off Trump, so he decided to not only cut Forbes' water supply off, but also began a smear campaign against him. However, the international community came to Forbes' defense, and soon hundreds of people began to spite Donald Trump by buying small shares of Forbes' land so that it would be harder for both Trump and the Scottish government to take possession of it via eminent domain. While the golf course still ended up being built, Forbes' farm was left intact, and he still lives there today. Number 8. Salad Ojani's Coffee House while it may seem strange to keep a business running when all the homes around it are torn down, in 2011, Salah Odiani did just that. You see, he was an Algerian immigrant who came to France in 1949, and in 1965, he opened the Café Chez Salah in the northern French neighborhood of Roubaix. While it had plenty of business when it first opened, in 2003 and 4, the area's last two major factories were closed down, so it was decided that the neighborhood would be completely torn down and rehabilitated. While everyone in the neighborhood was willing to sell, Ojani refused despite the fact that most of his customers had moved, and the inconvenience caused by the fact that his telephone, gas, and power were and still are occasionally cut off. Despite the hardship, he continues to serve cups of coffee and delicious pastries as if nothing happened. And while he only gets a few regulars as customers, the revitalization of the neighborhood that's supposed to be completed in 2022 should help spruce up his business. Number 7. The Victoria Hotel If you ever go to Amsterdam, then you can stay at the historic Victoria Hotel, although upon arriving you'll notice a strange sight at the facade. That's because there are currently two houses that are positioned right out front that seem a little out of place, and the story behind them is quite interesting. You see, in 1888, a group of businessmen decided that it would be ideal to build the Victoria Hotel right across from the Central Station, which is the city's main transportation hub. While most of the owners of buildings on the site sold, two houses refused. That's because Mr. Verbert, who was a barman, did not want to sell for too low, and he convinced his next-door neighbor, Mr. Carstens, who was a clothes maker, to make him his representative in negotiations. However, Mr. Verbert wasn't willing to sell for the offered sum of 4,000 builders, and as such, the developers just decided to build around the offending homes. And to this day, the two standouts in the hotel are city landmarks and are a must-see if you're in Amsterdam. Number 6. Toronto's Half House When it comes to nail houses, few are quite as strange as Toronto's Half House. Built as part of a collection of six, structurally attached to homes between the years 1890 and 1893, it originally served as low-class housing. But as Toronto became a world-class city, the area's land began to increase in value. In the mid-20th century, this came to a head when a land holdings company endeavored to buy the six-house block that the half house was part of. And while five acquiesced, 54 and a half St. Patrick Street held out. As a result, demolition crews were told to destroy every house except for that one. And in a feat that was impressive given the clunky machinery of the time, they destroyed the other houses in such a precise way that they kept the dividing wall between the other buildings and 54 and a half St. Patrick Street intact. As a result, the house now looks like part of a half that was perfectly sliced down the middle. Its current owners have since renovated it, so the side wall has an artistic backsplash, and it now sits as a fun and fascinating relic. Number 5. Edith Macefield Today, Seattle is best known for its hipsters, Starbucks aficionados, and relocated basketball teams. But when Edith Macefield bought her Seattle home in 1952, the city was a whole lot different. After all, at this point in time, it was far smaller, and Edith's home was initially in what was just a very small suburb. However, it wasn't long until the area became more developed, and things came to a head in the early 2000s when Edith was offered $1 million to sell her 1,000-square-foot home. Despite the attractive price tag, she refused, and this led to a massive high-rise being built around it. 
However, in a strange turn of events, a man by the name of Barry Martin, who was the development's construction superintendent, decided to befriend Edith. At this point, Edith was in her mid-80s and disabled, so in order to help her out, Barry would run her errands and do chores in the house. This ended up paying off in spades, because when Edith eventually passed away in 2008, she left the entire house to him. Upon inheriting the home, Barry cashed it in by selling it for 300 grand to a local businessman. Yet due to a complicated turn of events, the house was eventually bought by the development company and was never torn down. Number 4. The Spiegelhalter Clock Shop no one likes an annoying neighbor, but the clockmasters at the Spiegelhalter clock shop have always had a tougher time than most. That's because throughout the 1800s and 1900s, the shop had to contend with the department store Wickham's, which was a large box retailer at the time. Now, the tension between Spiegelhalters and Wickham's first began in 1892, when the Spiegelhalters agreed to move from 75 to 81 Mile End Road in order to accommodate the expansion of the Wickham store. In the 1920s, Wickham's then tried to buy them out so they could build a massive complex, but the Spiegelhalters refused. This prompted the Wickham's to simply build around their clock shop, with the hope being that the Spiegelhalters would lose enough business so they would be forced to agree to a buyout. However, the Spiegelhalters got the last laugh, as while Wickham's went out of business in the 1960s, the Spiegelhalters held on until 1982. Nowadays, the Spiegelhalter store is roofless and derelict, yet despite this, it still stands to this very day. Number 3. Vera Coking While today's Atlantic City is well known for its casinos, hotels, and shows, in the 1960s it was a far smaller town. In 1961, Vera Coking and her husband bought a property at 127 South Columbia Place as a summertime retreat for $20,000. Soon after, it became their bona fide home. However, the late 1970s marked a major change in the city, and it was during this time of development that real estate developer Bob Guccione offered Coking the modern equivalent of more than $3.9 million for her home. She refused, but in 1993 she was courted once again when Donald Trump tried to convince her to sell her home so that he could use it as parking space for limos at his Atlantic City casino and hotel. Yet even the smooth talking of the Donald would not convince her to budge, and this led to the city trying to evict her using the power of eminent domain. However, after a long battle, Coking won her case against the city, and as such, she remained in her prime piece of real estate until 2010, when she finally decided to move into a retirement home. At this point, she finally sold the house at a cut price of just $583,000, and it was demolished almost immediately afterwards. Number 2. The Oka Crisis most of the entries on this list were between small-time property owners and large contractors, but we'd say that the events surrounding the Oka crisis were a little more consequential. You see, the Oka crisis occurred in the Canadian city of Montreal, Quebec, when developers attempted to expand a 9-hole golf course into an 18-hole one with 60 condos. The problem with this was that it would destroy a wooded area known as the Pines, which was a place where a local native tribe known as the Kenesataki would conduct ceremonies, play lacrosse, and bury their dead. Unfortunately, the courts ruled in favor of the developers, and in 1990, the town of Oka tried to have the Kenesataki removed. However, the Kenesataki were in no mood for this and allied with the nearby Kanawake tribe to both barricade and guard the Pines, while also blocking off the Mercier Bridge, which is a vital transportation link between Montreal's suburbs and its downtown. In response, the military was brought in, and things reached ahead when a police constable by the name of Marcel Lemay was killed in a shootout with the Kanawake. While this event was unfortunate, the Canadian government soon realized that they had to reverse their hard stance, and on September 26th of 1990, they bought the Pines from the developers for a sum of $5.3 million and handed it back to the Kanesatake. To this day, the Pines are still enjoyed by the group, and this event goes to show that when indigenous people unite, they can firmly resist government pressure. Number 1. Luo Baogen's Home It's not hard to feel at least a little bad for Luo Baogen. A duck farmer by trade, he invested his life savings into a massive custom home in 2011 so that he, his wife, and four relatives could live in a large house with wood floors, built-in wardrobes, recessed lighting, and beautiful views of the countryside. However, just one year after he built it, officials told Baogan that his house was to be demolished in order to make way for a new road. While Baogan has spent the equivalent of about $120,000 on the structure, the Chinese Communist Party only offered him about $40,000 for it, so he quickly turned the offer down. 
Unfortunately for Baugen, the government simply decided to build a road around his home, and this led to it being surrounded by a sea of asphalt. The media quickly picked up the story and began to frame the home as a symbol of protest. However, likely as a result of government pressure, Baugen couldn't keep up the act for long, and soon after he settled for a marginally higher price of about $46,000, while also being given a guarantee that the local government would help cover some of the expenses if Baugen chose to rebuild elsewhere. In fact, Ying Jiayu, who was the Communist Party secretary of the village where the Wos lived, said in an official statement that, quote, he is not some so-called protester. That's just the name the media gave to him. He did not agree to move before, partly because he was not happy with the compensation, but also because he did not realize the road project required him to leave. He thought that it was just another property development project and he could still live there. Now he realizes he cannot just stay in the middle of the road and he does not like being called a protester." End quote. However, I leave you to decide whether or not that you think he was forced out or not. Watch our binge-watching playlist if you'd like to watch all of our most popular top 15 videos. Grab a drink, grab a snack, and get ready to binge.